My name is Michael Orth. I am the great grandson of the man that founded this uh, industry, this ice house that you're going to see. Uh, it was, uh, these ice houses were built in about 1877, and they operated uh, until 1944 during the war. Uh, it, actually, they ran out of manpower, and the, they, they had to give it up. This is a motion picture of the ice harvesting that was taken in the winter of 1935 and 1936. Uh, although it was taken by an amateur photographer, it was done fairly well. And it shows uh, the operation from the start to the finish. Uh, because uh, this film runs along rather rapidly, I'll explain to you a little bit of how, you know, what you're going to see. When the, when the lake would freeze over, they would watch it rather closely, and they'd measure it every day if, if need be. When it got to be seven inches thick, then it would hold a team of horses. And it, from that time on, they would uh, go out on the lake every day with uh, horses and uh, what did they call them? They were snowplow. They, they actually weren't a snowplow. They, they were a scraper. And they would scrape the ice and uh, dump it along the shore. And they keep measuring this ice. And when it got to be 12 inches thick, they could start the harvest. They would mark out the lake in accordance. They'd, they'd take uh, estimates on how much ice they needed the following summer, say uh, 60,000 60, tons, something like that. And they would mark out the lake accordingly. Uh, their, uh, the ice weighed about. They, they got about a, a thousand ton per acre. So uh, if they needed 60,000 ton, they'd, they'd mark out 60 acres and start harvesting. They'd scribe the lake with a hand scriber, one direction first across the lake, and then they'd draw another line perpendicular to it. And along these lines, and they would go along with uh, the field saw and cut the entire lake entire 60 acres. From then on, go along with a finishing saw. It was, uh, it was a mechanical saw. It was, they called it a turkey kicker. It was, just a, it was actually a hand saw that was just adapted to a gasoline engine. And when you'll see a picture of it. It's quite a, quite a thing. And they'd separate the, the flows that way. And when, you, when you'd see this, uh, this saw sawing along, you, you, you'll notice some men with uh, caulking bars, and they'd have to caulk those seams because when they went through uh, through the the ice to the water, the ice would come up, and if they didn't caulk those seams, the the water would run down all the all, all the seams in the ice and freeze the whole field again. So they had to be rather careful. And you all, all also notice along the sides of the of the channel and things, they had boards, and that was for the same reason, so that the water wouldn't get in the cracks. And after they finished uh, breaking off these flows, they'd run them towards the ice house in a, ch in a channel that they had previously cut, and they'd cut off uh, pieces of that uh, flow, ever smaller pieces, until finally they got individual pieces, and they would go up uh, a conveying system into the houses, and simple as that. Uh, they'd fill the houses about uh, 17, 18 tiers up and cover the whole thing with sawdust, and that would be the end of it. They'd, uh, ice that way would last about three years. So if, uh, if we could roll the film now, I'll kind of explain as we go along. This is the, the, the scrapers. You can see they went to, sh to shore, they just dump them, and they go back for another load. They did that because <coughs> there was a lot of uh, uh, snow on the ice, would, would make cloudy ice, and that was undesirable. This is the field saw. That would cut down to within probably uh, 8, 10 inches of the bottom. That would leave those remaining uh, inches to be cut by the, by the finishing saw. 
You can see they, they cut the whole field at once. It just those men were just guiding it and turning it around. At the end, it actually moved along in its own power. This is the finishing saw. They called it a turkey kicker. Just I don't know where that name came from, but and you see the men in the background. Those are the caulking crew. They're caulking the seams as they as they cut, so the ice, so the water doesn't flow down in, 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 into the other cuts. Another view of it. This man, he, he's just fooling, but that's a needle bar he has. That's what they use uh, to, uh, to, to, to break the ice apart. This is a flow that's probably 40, 60 ton of ice right there. The cakes were 21 by 21 by 12, and they weighed about 180 pounds. And in the summer, men would stack those uh, five high It'd take two men on a block and they'd hoist it up and imagine the work that was. I don't think you'd get people to work that way today, and I don't know what OSHA would say anyway about that. This is my dad on the left and my grandfather on the right. Here they're separating the 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 flow you they, breaking off uh, pieces here they go in the channel there's double a, a double line of cakes and they break them individually it was a highly intensive labor intensive operation they usually had about 140 men working to do that it would take them about three weeks to fill those houses. This is, this is uh, going up into the gallery. That's uh, the scraper there where they'd scrape the top of the ice. This is pushing the ice into the houses. This is the field from the, from the, from, from the gallery. That gallery was 40 feet high. You can see how the, the floors would come into the channel there. In 1944, and on the last time they cut ice, they did this with 35 men. But they only put up about uh, 35,000 ton. That other piece of uh, you saw there, that was a slush slide. <laughs> this is Al Klutz. He was, uh, he was uh, the general foreman. These are men that are, are, are lowering the gallery that was suspended on cables so that you could, they could adjust it. In summertime, they would uh, uh, make, make it in a slanting position so that the ice would slide down it because they, they didn't use the, the steam engine in summertime. It seems like it was a very dangerous occupation, but I, I, I don't remember anybody ever getting hurt that bad there. That gallery was 40 feet high, and there was only a 12-inch plank to, to, to walk along up there. Here, this is the start of, of a new house they're starting on the bottom. They go up about 17, 18 to 20 tier high. This is a rotary snowplow brought in from Colorado. There was so much snow that year that the Milwaukee Road didn't have their own equipment. This is our veterinarian, Dr. Kluke, with his snowmobile, first snowmobile. The Random Lake Fire Department.
downtown Random Lake. Here again we see how the, that was so cold that winter that, that the ice got away on them. It, it, it's, over, it's over 12 inches thick here, obviously, and it's very hard to handle. The summer crew had a heck of a time loading those on the boxcars, I imagine. Again, these are men with the needle bars separating the, the ice. This is removing ice out on Highway 57. There was so much snow that year, the snow plows couldn't move it. These are all prominent businessmen from Random Lake. Eddie Becker, Al Altenhofen, he was a real estate man. George, uh, Henry Creer, the Creer Preserving Company. Art Bajer, he had a Dr. Kluck, Dr. Detman and Dr. Malloy, a veterinarian, a dentist, and our physician. There's, you see the ice out in the background. This is where the managers and the timekeeper and like that stayed up in this house. The foreman. They had their own cook, Eddie, Eddie Schmitz. He also cooked for the boarding house that was in back in one house to the north. You see how much snow there was that year. It doesn't look like much now, but when this steam engine comes closer, you'll see on the what that had to go through. This is our neighbor, Fan Noah. This is, this is the dedication of Sheboygan Marsh. I, I don't know what year that was. It would probably be in about 1940 or something like that. 40, 41. These pictures are taken by Mr. Wilbur Hills of Random Lake. He was, he was the president of our bank there. I think he was on the county board also. This is his house in Random Lake. And this is Mrs. Hiltz. This is how the ice houses look from the lake. That other picture never really showed. There's four or five houses there. There were a few more. Uh, one got taken down in a tornado in about 1924. Here again is a field saw. I, I don't know if I mentioned it. Uh, this portion is taken about 1942. Here are the planks on the side so that the ice didn't wash. It, 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 it pre uh, prevented erosion. Here again, the, the men caulking the seams. And this is a different Turkey kicker, if you notice from the last one, this one's built out of iron steel. Here's 
here again is a, they, they had to constantly scrape that lake. This was Joel Godfrey, his name was. He was the, the engineer of the man that kept the steam engine rolling. Here again is a shot of the water. They call it the water box. That was the end of the conveyor, and they just lower that down into the lake. There's a view from the top of the gallery again. You see, they didn't have much to stand on. That's the slush sign. That was run by, uh, by ropes, uh, uh, transmission ropes. There's the whistle to tell the people when to go to work, when to quit. <laughs> After they would get the houses filled, they would, they would uh, the Milwaukee Road would bring out what they call their ice train. They did, they'd bring out about 100 cars, and they would fill those cars and take them to Milwaukee, and uh, the Milwaukee Road had their own ice house in Milwaukee. Here again, men are... Well, that's about all it, uh, I say. It, it ran until about uh, uh, 1944, I think it was. In uh, 1946, they tore it down. Uh, most of the lumber went to housing in Sheboygan. So. It was probably one of the only ice houses that ever torn down. Most of them, they just burned to the ground. But after the war, lumber was rather scarce, so they saved it. So. And that ends my... <laughs>